going to talk mostly about constitutional law, constitutional values. We're not going to get into the arcane details of campaign finance regulation. But five years ago, it was in the fall, actually it was the 2005-2006 year, I did a presentation here called Freedom of Speech, the United States versus the rest of the world. And I wanted to discuss the extensive protection that we provide to freedom of speech under the Constitution, more so than under the Constitution of other democratic countries and international human rights norms. And I use the main <coughs> example of hate speech. We protect hate speech. A classic case is in 1977, a group of self-styled Nazis wanted to march in Skokie, a suburb of Chicago with a large Jewish population, including many Holocaust survivors. They wanted to march in Nazi regalia. In the rest of the world, that would be illegal. In Germany, it's a crime oh, yeah. to belong to a Nazi-type organization. Even in Canada, which has a free speech guarantee similar than ours, it doesn't protect uh, advocacy of genocide, Holocaust denial, and so forth. We do protect it. Uh, we have a very expansive definition of freedom of speech. Advertisements, simply product ads, are protected speech. Striptease dancing is protected speech because it conveys a message of sexuality. Now, it doesn't mean that the government cannot regulate in this area, but it has to justify the regulation. It can't prohibit the speech simply because it thinks it's not desirable. Well, one of the things that emerged from the discussion that I had at the presentation is that why do we give so much protection to freedom of speech. And the views that were expressed here, which I later incorporated into a piece of writing about free speech, is that freedom of speech is part of American culture. We believe in protecting freedom of speech, even when it is highly offensive. And there are many doctrines, including the protection of <coughs> offensive speech. Uh, some other notions, some other concepts, I should say, of freedom of speech. <clears throat> While we protect the right of the speaker, the primary value to be advanced by protection of freedom of speech is the right of people to listen, the right of people to get information. So from the standpoint of the First Amendment, the more information people have, the better it is. Now, there's a notion of trust. We have to trust the people to be able to make good decisions by receiving a maximum of information. Now, that's sometimes hard for academics and intellectuals. And it's become even harder with blogs and the 24-7 cable. How can people believe this stuff? Uh, they're going to make bad decisions. Well, the answer is that it is a, a, a value a postulate of the First Amendment that the government cannot say that there are bad ideas. Uh, and that's very, very controversial because I say in the rest of the world there are bad ideas. Uh, genocide is a bad idea. Racism is a, racism, racism is a bad idea. Sexism is a bad idea. Not so under the First Amendment. Uh, another point, the theory of the First Amendment <coughs> is that there is a marketplace of ideas. Conceptualize, picture a market. And what the First Amendment does is saying that every idea can get into the marketplace and they compete with each other, but the First Amendment prohibits efforts to equalize the markets so that the media has a very big stall. Uh, corporate interests have a very big stall. The lone blogger, uh, what we used to say the, uh, uh, the lone speaker uh, or, the, or the lone uh, uh, the person uh, with the handbill, 
Uh, but now we say the one blogger has a small stall. But the idea of the First Amendment is that there have to be the stalls, uh, that every, every idea must be able to compete. Now, what does this have to do with campaign finance regulation? Uh, it goes back, you gotta be pretty, you gotta be somewhat older to remember this, but this was the Watergate scandal, 1974, where former President Nixon resigned, accused of a cover-up in uh, the Watergate burglary by the Republican Party. But at that time, there was aware of corporate, corporate influence. Everybody was seeking campaign contributions from corporate interests, from wealthy interests, and that was a fraction of what campaign contributions are now. Well, let's talk a little bit about why money matters. Uh, the cost of campaigning, workers running a campaign, just the ordinary ads co come up to a lot of money. In close races, money can make a difference. And often party control of one us or the other may depend on the results in a number of close Races. Incumbents raise money to discourage challengers both in the primary and general election. A lot of people say, well, I can't run because I, I just can't raise uh, that amount of money. Political parties put money into competitive races. I'm going to use an example here of a former state Republican legislator named Rocky Rankowski, whom I know. Uh, Rocky ran against Carl Levin for a uh, Senate seat in 2008. Uh, it was an act, no, the Republicans wouldn't give him any money because they had no chance whatsoever of beating Carl Levin. On the other hand, in 2010, he was running for Congress uh, in the 9th Congressional District against Gary Peters. 2010 was clearly a Republican year. Uh, Oakland County is a one of those areas that is you know, very much uh, open for grabs. The Republicans believed that they could win. They put a lot of money in because they wanted to win the seat. The Democrats wanted to save the seat. They put a lot of money in. It was a very close race. <coughs> An enormous amount of money was, uh, was, put in, was put in the race. Peters happened to win. Uh, I would add that there's never a shortage of money. Now, the Democrats took a slacking, as President Obama put it, uh, in the last election. But it wasn't for lack of money. Uh, and they had made choices about where you put your money, uh, but candidates had adequate money. Now, federal financing is interesting. Congress passed the law <coughs> providing for federal funding for presidential campaigns. No, they would never pass a law providing for federal funding for congressional campaigns, because that would encourage candidates to challenge incumbents. But they had it there for federal, if you, had to, if you took congressional money, if you took uh, federal money, uh, you had to agree uh, that you would not uh, spend so much. In other words, it limited the amount of expenditures. Obama blew this open with the internet. Uh, and raised so, we raised so much money that he early said, I won't need federal financing. <coughs> this forced McCain to reject it as well. <coughs> and I don't think you're going to see presidential candidates accepting federal financing because that would show a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. uh, does money win? The, the answer is, is no. Uh, I was a wonderful op-ed in the New York Times by David Brooks, it was last October, one of my favorite commentators. He's a conservative. I'm very far on the left in my own views, but he's pretty accurate. And he showed that money doesn't make a difference in a lot of races. He used the example, <coughs> excuse me, one example is that of the Republican Senate primary in Delaware. 